Hello and good morning. It's a beautiful morning. Appreciate our visitors. Thank you for choosing to be with us today. Good to see uh, the church family, uh, those of you here in person, and those of you who are Zooming in. Also, if you're visiting on Zoom, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions about, you know, the Bible or about the church or anything, uh, please let us know. Uh, reach, you can reach us at our uh, website, uh, the HonoluluCOC.org. And so, welcome. Before we uh, get to our Bible class this morning, I would like to lead prayers uh, for our bookmark. Uh, for the sake of our visitors, uh, one, uh, one of our efforts as a congregation in evangelism is this bookmark effort where we uh, write uh, 10 names of people that we know, people that we would like to see obey the gospel, and we pray for those names uh, every time we see this bookmark, right? And so uh, we believe that uh, prayer is, is, the first, is the first line of evangelism in reaching the people that we want to share uh, the gospel with. And I praise God that he has answered you know, uh, our prayers and has caused increase in our congregation uh, through our efforts. And so at this time, go ahead and take out your bookmark. And if you'd like to get a bookmark, we have uh, a table in the back. Feel free to grab it. Everything in our evangelism table in the back is free and it's for everyone to use. But let's pray together for these souls. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of prayer. But we know the power of prayer, Lord, lies not within the fact that we pray, but to whom we pray. And Father, we thank you so much for loving us and giving each of us, Lord, who are Christians, the opportunity to obey the gospel. We thank you so much, Father, for the people that you put in our lives that encouraged us and lead us to the cross of Jesus. We thank you for your church, where we encourage one another until we get to that day where we get to be with you in eternity. Father, we, we love you and we want to obey the Great Commission. And Father, we pray for all the souls, the names on our bookmark, the people that we come in contact with, Lord, on a daily basis. Help us, Father, to have the wisdom and the knowledge to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as we share the gospel of Jesus. And forgive us, Father, when we fail in this regard. Equip us, Lord, through your word. May we not only be hearers, but doers of your word. Be with us now as we study your word. Allow our hearts, Lord, to be molded by your word so we can be more, so we can be more like your son, Jesus. Please be with our church family that cannot be with us this morning. Those who are sick, those who are struggling, whatever that case may be, Lord, please bless them and bring them back to us in the next appointed time. Father, we are mindful of those who are hurting and are suffering from the fires in Maui. And we pray, Lord, for your church there the Maui Church of Christ, and their efforts to reach the community. We pray, Father, that much good is done, but also, Lord, souls may be won to you through this event. We pray, Father, for comfort and for peace for all those who have lost loved ones during this tragedy. Help us, Father, to do our part 
to do good in this great opportunity that you have given to us and to do it for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts. We are studying the book of Acts, and we are in Acts chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us about the one who saves us, tells us about the Savior, Jesus. From Romans to Revelation, the Bible teaches us how to walk, how to live as Christians, how to be Christ-like, how to be the church that he has called us to be a part of. But the book of Acts connects the gospel and the epistles as the book that tells us how one can be a Christian, how one is saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 25, and i like to um, read this text once again, and then uh, summarize the lessons of application that we covered uh, in the past week. And then we'll continue on in the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. So Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none, of these, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. In our point of application, we talked about preaching Jesus, because in the beginning of this chapter, uh, we read about Stephen uh, being stoned to death because he preached Jesus. We read about the persecution that came upon the church, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. And they were scattered abroad, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Right? They preached Jesus. And we read about this Jew named Philip going down to the Samaritans and preached Jesus to them. In Acts 8 and verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Even this deceiver, Simon, the sorcerer, was converted to Jesus through the preaching of Philip. And so we talked about preaching Jesus in the first point of application. If we're going to preach Jesus, we need to preach using the scriptures. You cannot preach Christ without the scriptures, right? That's what Paul, Paul did. That's what Philip did here. That's what every uh, gospel preacher we read about in the New Testament. That's what they did. They preached the scriptures. We're going to look at Philip again. And the Bible would say about Philip and the eunuch. And beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him, right? So if we're going to preach Jesus... We need to preach using the scriptures. Number two, if we're going to preach Jesus, we need to preach against sin. We need to preach against sin, right? That's what Philip did. 
Uh, that's what the apostles did and everyone. Jesus did the same thing. One, one of the main messages of his ministry, of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, the message was summarized in the New Testament for us. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the preaching that they, they performed. So if we're going to preach Jesus, we need to preach about man's greatest problem, right? And that is sin. We preach about the solution to sin. That is to be covered by the blood of Jesus through baptism. We're going to preach Jesus. We preach using the scriptures. We're going to preach Jesus. We preach against sin. We're going to preach Jesus. We need to preach about the church, his kingdom. That's what Philip did. And he preached the things, uh, Acts 8 and verse 12, concerning the kingdom of God, the church. We are the kingdom of God on this earth. The kingdom that when he taught the model of prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, the kingdom came. And we talked about it. It came with power, Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. It came on Pentecost when the power came, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. We need to preach about the pride of Christ, the church, his kingdom. If we're going to, and last but not least, if we're going to preach Jesus, we need to preach faithfulness. We need to preach about being faithful. Being baptized is only the beginning. We have the rest of our lives to serve the Lord and be faithful. Revelation 2 and verse 10 to a persecuted church. Jesus said to them, you be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Well, that last application we made from the story of Simon, the sorcerer here that we just read, how he was baptized and then he sinned. He had a, a, a wrong understanding about the gift of God. He thought. His money was good enough to receive this gift, to purchase the gift of God. And so he sinned. And so when Christians sin, and it happens, right? Right after baptism, you're going to be tempted. You're going to stumble. It happens. But faithfulness will, will call for us to repent, to call on God in prayer and ask for his, for, for his forgiveness we talked about the two laws of pardon, all right, fancy terms, but basically the first law of pardon is for the entire world or for sinners. The first law of pardon is to obey the gospel. If one does not obey the gospel, prayer will do him no good. If one does not obey the gospel, asking God for forgiveness will do him no good because forgiveness comes first of all through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the first law of pardon. The second law of pardon is repentance. Asking God for forgiveness. Because as his children, we're going to sin. We're not going to be perfect. We should not continue in sin. Romans chapter 6, Paul said. Shall we say, shall we continue? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. God forbid, how shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? All right, so we are not to continue in sin. But when we do sin as God's child, the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. First John chapter 1 and verse 5, all the way to chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 2. All right, And so if we're going to preach Christ... We need to preach using the scriptures. We need to preach against sin. We need to preach about his kingdom, the church. We need to preach about being faithful to him. A any thoughts on this before we continue? <clears throat> now, let's look at the second block of text there. The conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. This is one of those conversion accounts that is filled with the details that people need to know in order for them to obey the gospel. If 
if your gift is not leading a Bible study, like like uh, um, in our in our process of evangelism or in our efforts in evangelism, some of us are teachers, right? You you have three types of of workers in the kingdom. You have the bringers. Some of us are very good at just inviting people. Hey, come to church with me. Hey, would you like to study with my preacher? Right. We're, we have the bringers. And then you have the teachers, those who have the ability to teach the gospel to others. Right. And then you have the keepers, those who are encouragers, who are Barnabases in the church, who build up those who are new in the faith and build up one another. Right. So you have the bringers, the teachers and the and the keepers. Some can be all three. Some are just that talented and gifted. Some can be all three. Some may have two of them. Some may, may just be one. But whatever talent you have, use it for the Lord. Right. Whatever ability, use it for the Lord. And so if you are a bringer and maybe you are in a situation where you just feel like this is a type of person that when they read the Bible, right, when they read the Bible, they are likely to obey the gospel. Right? Here's one of those accounts that I want to encourage you. Share that with them. Share this account of the unit with them. Because it contains everything in there that a person needs to do in order to obey the gospel. All right. So I'd like for us to read it first, and then we'll come back and, and highlight some important things from this text. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards so the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other men? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Asotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. One of the first things I want us to highlight is that evangelism is the work of the Spirit of God. We talked about how the book of Acts can be called uh, uh, by various names. It can be called the Acts of the Apostles. Because what you read is the Apostles receiving the Holy Spirit of God. And they went preaching. It can be called the acts of the church. Because you read about the church multiplying. About the church finding favor in, in all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. But it can also be called the acts of the Holy Spirit. 
Because throughout the, the book of Acts, you see the spirit working through uh, the Christians, working with the apostles, working with the church. The spirit is the one revealing the truth to those who are preaching. Someone read John 16 and verse 13 for us. John 16 and verse 13. All right, this is what Jesus said the, to the apostles that, that were with him in the upper room. He said to them, this, this, will, this will happen. All right? The spirit will give you everything you need and bring to remembrance some things that you've already heard. And, and for the sake of our visitors, if you'd like to read, raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Okay, so, so, that, our, um, so that our Zoomers also hear the reading of the scriptures. Yes. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. Thank you. He is called there, he is the spirit of truth. If you find someone saying, the Holy Spirit of God told me this, and they say something other than the truth, you better question what they're saying. Or you better question what they're saying. The spirit of God will not teach error. All right? The spirit of God will not teach error. False teaching. He is the spirit of truth. In verse 29, he, he tells Philip where to go. Right? He tells Philip, uh, the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. All right? Now, I don't know what the spirit of God sound like. I don't know. But again, when someone says, well, the spirit told me this, you have to wonder. Today, today, if they say that. Because I, I have never heard the Spirit of God speak into my ears. I, I don't know what he sounds like. All right. So today, when God's Spirit speaks, he speaks from the Word of God. When you are out in the public, you have in your heart to evangelize, to tell somebody about Jesus. You have that in your heart because you know the commandments. Jesus says, go into all the world and, and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why you feel that urge to say, oh, man, I want to tell them about Jesus. Or when, when you have, when you meet someone, this happened to me in many occasions, you meet someone that you, you, your first impression of them is, man, you're such a good person. You know, what, what a good person to be around. And when they leave without you saying anything about the gospel, or any invitation, or, or just nothing relating to, to spiritual things, it will make you feel bad. It will make you feel, it definitely made me feel bad the times I've done that, all right? Because the word of God or the seed of the gospel is in us. It's telling us to share the gospel with others. So today, right, today, the spirit of God speaks in that sense through the word, right? He's not whispering in our ears, that we should go and join ourselves to this bus or to this, you know, whatever the, the situation may be. In the days of, of the first century Christians, they were told by the Holy Spirit what they must do. So let's remember that evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? To be filled with the Spirit of God. And so we are filled with the spirit of God and we evangelize when the seed of the gospel is growing in our hearts. Here the spirit tells Philip to go and Philip ran. Right? In evangelism, we need to make haste. In evangelism, we need to be in a hurry. We need to run to the souls that are in need. Church, we have a great opportunity with this tragedy in Mount, you know, um, yesterday I was talking with 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 some of, uh, of the Christians that came and and uh, watched the kids' soccer game. After the soccer game, we came and hung out hung out under a tree there at the park, and and I just couldn't help. I I, I talked to them. I said, "Man, we 
we have a great opportunity here to do good with the with the situation in Maui. And, and I know that we're sending money. I know some of you have sent money. And I know we are planning to send money. But I know we can do more than just send money. I know that we can do more than send money. We got to, we got to figure out some of the ways where we can help as a church. Because sending money, yes, we're helping the Maui church. And in a sense, they are the middlemen, right? They are helping because they are on the ground. But we got to figure out the other ways that the Honolulu Church of Christ can be involved directly in helping with this effort, right? And so we got to look for those opportunities to help the families, right? Um, one of the things I, I want to encourage you, you know, I, I, trust, uh, I trust donating to the church, right? I don't know about donating to the different organizations, and all the different donations that have come out because of this uh, of this tragedy. But if you can find a family that is hurting, that they are directly impacted by this by this uh, uh, tragedy, donate directly to them. Send your resources or or help, however you want to help, clothing, food whatever you can help with, send it directly to the families. Because some of the donations that are set up, they won't have access to any of those funds until a certain time period, right? But they need help right now, right? And I know one might say, well, the government, FEMA is in effect. FEMA has been called in. You know, the government is not there to do the good that the church is supposed to be doing. Right, the church needs to do good. Right, the government will be known for the good that the government does. Right, and there's a lot of question marks there, but we should be doing good. Right, so so I wanna. Part of me wish I did, I wasn't going on a trip, because I would dig and find out how we our church can help families right now. But I want to encourage you, could you find out what ways we can help directly, right? Not through a donation, uh, not, not through a donation by an organization. I'm not saying those things are bad, but I'm saying let's do good and let the world see or let the people of Maui see the good that the Honolulu Church of Christ can do, all right? Not the, not the shelters can do. We appreciate that. Not the government can do, we appreciate that, but what the church is doing for them. Last time I, I checked, 86 people died. It has gone higher. So that, that number has gone higher. I can't, I can't imagine. It's been, it's been uh, uh, described as the worst fire in American history. Uh, that's what I heard one one uh, reporter say uh, uh, in regards to the, the 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 death toll. All right, no one, not one of those souls that have perished, plan to enter eternity that way. None of them, and you, you can even imagine that some of them saw the fire and maybe thought, "Well, it's not a problem." only to perish later, right? Ralph shared with me that, that uh, he had co-workers that had uh, uh, come to a meeting from Maui on the day before, before that evening, the fires spread. Uh, when they left Maui and they shared with Ralph that, you know, and, and in, their, in their business meeting or their company meeting um, that, that the fires were, were just minimal, that it wasn't a concern. And then later that evening, it, it devoured an entire, an entire, uh, entire neighborhood. And I, to my understanding, it's still burning right now. They're still fighting fires, All right? And it, it, it goes to show several things. 
Number one, how quickly things can change. How quickly things can change. One day we're, we're eating, drinking, and being merry. The next day, we're in eternity. Or the next moment in that case, we're in eternity. Number two, it shows that if you don't take care of the little problems, that it will become a big problem. If you don't take care of the little problems, it will become a big problem. I think about James. In James chapter 3, when James talks about the power of the tongue, James says, see how great a forest is kindled by a little fire. Little problems can be big problems. If, we, if you keep sweeping it under the rug, the rug will burn. Right? You've got to take care of the little problems or they will become big. Back to, to Acts. Evangelism is a work of the Holy Spirit. He is involved in sharing the gospel. We must make haste as Philip did. The Spirit said, go and join yourself to this chariot. He ran. Right? He didn't walk. He just said, well, let, let me see what I want to do now before I join myself to that chariot. He joined himself to that chariot and he asked a very important question. Do you understand what you are reading? There are many souls when, when it comes to evangelism, you'll try to talk to someone about Jesus and they, they might tell you, oh, I read the Bible back and forth from, or I read the Bible from the beginning to the end multiple times. Last week, I heard someone said, I read it 20 times from the beginning to the end. They have not obeyed the gospel. All right. I'm not going to knock Bible reading because that's how you begin to grow. You grow by ingesting, by getting the word of God into your heart, reading the word of God. Right? Reading the word of God is important. Jesus said to the Sadducee, you do err not reading, not, not knowing the scriptures. Right? Oftentimes he will say to the Pharisees, have you not read? That he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. Right? Reading is important. And I'm not knocking Bible reading. But I will say this, it's not enough. But just reading the Bible, it's not enough. Here's a man who was reading the scriptures. The Bible says he came to Jerusalem for to worship. That tells me he's a Bible reader. Travel from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. Not just that. He's a eunuch. A eunuch can't go into the temple. They're not allowed into the, the temple area to worship. It tells me of his dedication. He knows that he can't enter into the temple area, but he went to Jerusalem for the worship. Still made the journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Sometimes we wake up Sunday morning, we don't want to make the journey. Here's a man who's devoted to the Lord He was reading his Bible. He was asked a very important question. You know, in evangelism, you have to ask a lot of questions of people. One of those questions is this. Do you understand what you just read? When we, when we study back to the Bible, is, is one of the methods that we use. Is one of the simple methods. You read the Bible, and then basically, it's, it's basically reading comprehension. right? As basic as that is. It is lacking in a lot of folks. Some people read the, the Bible and they just don't comprehend what they just read. And that's why there are teachers. 
That's why Jesus says, go, preach the gospel, All right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them some more, All right? So reading is not enough. You have to ask people questions, and I thank God for this eunuch. Because when he was asked, he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? He didn't say, well, Philip, I have read the scroll of, of Isaiah over and over. I know what it says. You know, some people would lie to you, even though they don't know what the word says. Some of the people will say that. They say, I've read the Bible from cover to cover multiple times. A straight up lie. You know, some people do. It's a straight up lie. All right. Here is an honest man reading the scroll of Isaiah. Didn't know what he was reading. And he asked, please help me. All right. Please help me. How can I? unless someone guides me and he asked Philip to come up and sit with me. I want to encourage us, if you don't know how to teach the gospel to someone, send somebody who does. Connect them with someone who does know and then they can teach you or learn or grow in that, in that ability to be able to teach the gospel. Teaching the gospel to others is not just knowing the scriptures. There's an attitude that you must have. There's tactfulness that you must have. You have to be considerate of the person in front of you, of the soul that is sitting in front of you. All right. So if you don't know it, connect that soul with someone who knows. All right. Because the last thing you want to do is to do what I did right after I was baptized. All right. The last thing you want to do is to take your zeal for the Lord without any knowledge and burn all the bridges that you have in your life. All right. That's what I did. All right. After baptism, I wanted to talk to my family about the gospel, but I did not know how to approach them. And you know what happened? All right. they, they were turned off. It's interesting, but several of our members have shared, you know, this encounter with their family after trying to share the gospel with their own family members. Some of you share this with me, and it's almost like word for word uh, uh, what, what your families have, have said to you and what my family said to me. They said, let's just be family. Let's not talk about church when we come together. Let's just be family. Right? It's exactly what my brother said to me. Right? And that's 10 years ago when that happened. Still this day, he has not been open because of the way I have approached him. Now, maybe it's because of his heart, but let me tell you, it's the way we approach that matters. That matters. If their heart is not right, their heart is not right. But if we don't approach properly, right, then, then we are doing evangelism wrong. How can I unless someone guides me? Raise your hand if someone guided you in obeying the gospel. Right. That's what happens. God sends people to guide people in obeying the gospel. Here, the, uh, Philip is sent to the unit, and then the Bible says the place in the scripture which he read was this. You want to share with us this morning? Isaiah fifty-three is the chapter. The eunuch had a scroll. It didn't have any chapters or verses, but it had the very words of Isaiah fifty-three as we have it. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation. His justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. In the very next verse, the eunuch asked questions. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? 
again, reading comprehension, right? You're reading, you want to ask, who's speaking? To whom is he speaking? What is it speaking about? What is it saying? And then, and then before we apply it, that's what we need to do, right? If we just read a verse and make up, you know, some, in some cases, you can read a verse and make direct application, like in the book of Proverbs. Very practical, very direct. In some places in the scriptures, I would say most of the scriptures, you have to know the context to make the proper application, right? There, there, there isn't Christians running around today trying to build an ark because we know who was commanded to build an ark. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It was not. Those are the basic things. There are people out there that just don't know just that. They don't know it. But you know it. And I know it. Right? Can we read a passage and explain context to somebody? Yes. That's part of evangelism. Read the passage. Explain it as the passage reveals it. Right? He asks the question of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip uh, opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. Our first point again, right? If we're going to preach Jesus, preach the scriptures. It just so happened the scriptures is Isaiah 53. Can you preach Jesus from the Old Testament? Yes. All right. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. All right. You cannot have one without the other. All right. If there is no Genesis, there is no Matthew. There's no revelation. You got to think about this. There are some believers who attack the creation account and say, well, that's not literal. The six days are not literal. How did Jesus view the days of creation? Literally. Right? And so you cannot have the New Testament Without the Old Testament, we did a series of sermons, Jesus in the Old Testament. In the very first book, we read about Jesus. He's the creator. And God said, let there be light and there was light. After the fall, we read about salvation. Genesis 3 and verse 15. And between your seed and her seed. God speaking to the devil or to the serpent. The seed of woman will crush his head. The seed of woman is Jesus. All right. In Exodus, we read that he is our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In the book of Numbers, he is the brass or bronze serpent that was raised. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. In Joshua, he is the captain of the Lord's army. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In Judges, he is the savior. The word judges there in the Hebrew means saviors, right? Not, not like a judge that sit on the throne and say, order in the court. These are saviors, right, that, G that God sent. And they are shadows of the savior, right? First Samuel. To second, second Chronicles, he is the king of kings. He is the seed of David that will sit on his throne and his kingdom there shall be no end. If you want to know the rest of that series, it's on YouTube. All right, I'm drawing blank. I preached that last year. But anyways, the entire Bible is about Jesus. The entire Bible. If there's a name that summarized the entire Bible is Jesus. All right. And so Philip used the Old Testament to preach Jesus. It's what the apostles had at the time when they preached Jesus. They had the Old Testament scriptures from Genesis all the way to Malachi. They had it available 
uh, the canon of scriptures was available to them. Someone read 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. Right, Verse 15 to chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 to chapter 4 and verse 4. Can someone read that for us. One second, sister. Could, could we give you the mic? Yes, thank you. Thank you. No, it's all right. We, we give our visitors two passes. <laughs> and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Keep going. Chapter I four. charge mm -hmm. thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, repro reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Thank you. Verse 15, Paul said to Timothy, from a childhood, you have learned the Holy Scriptures. It's talking about the Old Testament. That's what he had. He had the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was able to make Timothy wise unto salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped, may be thoroughly equipped unto every good were it's the scriptures that will make one wise unto salvation. It is the scriptures that will correct, that will rebuke, that will reprove, that will instruct a person that will fully equip the man or woman of God to do his work. It is the scriptures that we ought to preach. Paul to Timothy, I charge you before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead, preach the word, preach the scriptures, right? preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. One preacher said, preach it when they don't want to hear it, preach it when they want to hear it. Now it's just preach it no matter the time, no matter the season, preach the word. Now why, Paul, should we preach the word? Because some will not endure it. Some will not hear it. Some will not listen to it. And we read in the Bible of Christians that have walked with the apostles that have been faithful. And then they wandered away from the truth. Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. All right. We need to preach the word. And that's what Philip did, went back to Acts 8. Beginning of the scriptures from the Old Testament, Philip taught the gospel to the eunuch. Now, we're not given all the details of the teaching, right? But that's where, you know, the totality of the New Testament comes in. You must know the New Testament teaching about preaching the gospel, all right? We, we highlight it. You need to use the scriptures. You need to preach about the kingdom, the church. You need to preach about sin 
and how you can be saved from those sins. Right, notice what, the, what happened to this unit. <clears throat> In uh, verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? All right. So we hear him preach Jesus to him. And then we don't have all the details that this chariot has been going. I can't imagine the things they were talking about. The, the type of questions that the eunuch had asked. Do you think the eunuch asked Philip how he can be forgiven of his sins? I believe so. All right? Because in Isaiah 53, the Bible tells us that he has bore our sorrows. That God has cast on Jesus the iniquities of us all. That's sin. Right? And what the eunuch heard from Philip is, here is someone that's coming. Messiah, Savior, he is going to die. And he has died in, in, the, in the timing here. He has died for your sins. So very likely this eunuch asked, how can I be forgiven of sins? What do you think Philip taught him? Do you think he taught him about baptism? Absolutely. Absolutely. He taught him that he needed to believe the gospel. That he needed to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. That's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16. Going to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So the eunuch was taught about baptism. And you and I know there are so many out there that say you don't need to be baptized to be saved. You need to be baptized to be saved under this covenant, under the new covenant. What hinders me from being baptized? I got a question for someone maybe here this morning or maybe listening on Zoom. What hinders you from being baptized? There, there are some who have heard me preach and have heard that God's not just me. There are some connected to this congregation. You have heard preachers after preachers. And then this preacher preached the gospel, offered the plan of salvation, and you still haven't obeyed it yet. What's hindering you from being baptized? What's stopping you from being saved? In Acts 22 and verse 16. A man who blasphemed God. A man who consented to the killing of a Christian. And probably more. A man who persecuted the church of God. When he heard the truth. For the first time. When he heard the truth for the first time. He was told go into the city. And it would be told you. Words. That you must hear. The things that you must do. In order to be saved. It's Apostle Paul, right? He was a sinful man. But when he heard the gospel for the first time, a preacher was sent to him. And the preacher came to Paul, who had already been preached through by the Lord Jesus himself. And the preacher said to Paul, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You know the gospel. You know what you must do. 
Paul had been praying for three days. If prayer saved him, he wouldn't need to be baptized. He has been praying. And Ananias came and, and Paul re gives this account, Acts 22 and verse 16. He says, why tarryest thou? Arise, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. If you're listening this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, you need to arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Of the Lord. What hinders me from being baptized? He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I love this. I love this translation of the Bible because it gives the confession. There are some translations that don't have the confession of the eunuch. All right. And, and, and there's a lot into that. Uh, we we'll, won't dive into it. But one of the reasons why I use the, the King James or the New King James, it's because it has this con, con, confession of the eunuch. He made the great confession, the confession that we made. I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he stopped the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he immersed him, baptized him, baptizo, the Greek word. It always means immersion. It never means sprinkling. It never means pouring. There are Greek words for sprinkling and pouring. That's not the word used here by the Holy Spirit. That's the word immersion. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So the eunuch saw him no more. No more and he went on his way rejoicing. When one comes out of the watery grave of baptism is an occasion of rejoicing. The Bible says that the heavens rejoice over the sinner that repents, over the sinner that comes back to God. We are out of time. I appreciate your, your attention. Um, and I appreciate your prayers for me and my family as we travel this coming Tuesday. Um, we have uh, guest speakers lined up. Uh, for the next uh, two Sundays, uh, I encourage you to be here. Uh, and to our church family, I want to give you a challenge. Find the ways that we can help with the Maui uh, uh, event. Not just sending money. We're, it matters. The money you send matters. But also find ways where we can be of direct help to the families that are in need. During this time. That's my challenge for our church. I wish I, I wasn't leaving. But for the next two weeks. I pray and I hope God. And when I come back. I hear great things. That I hear that we're preparing to help. In other ways. Than just sending money. Right? Let's help in other ways. I forgot to, men forgot to mention. But your prayers are helpful as well. Right? Your prayers are helpful as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father we thank you so much for your love and for your word that continues to instruct us, Lord, and to guide us and to help us, Lord, to walk the narrow path. Be with us now, Father, as we prepare to worship you in spirit and in truth. Again, Lord, please be with those who are in Maui, uh, the Maui church and their efforts, Lord, to, to help those who are in need. And Father, use us as vessels in your hands to do good for your glory. Help us to find the ways where we can also be of a, a direct help to the families that are in need. Be with us now as we prepare to worship you in spirit and in truth. May everything that we say, do, and think in our hearts bring glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.